Hi everyone, thanks for joining our virtual living room. Grab a cup of tea, or if it's nighttime where you're at, make sure it's not caffeinated tea, maybe some chamomile, chamomile. And you guys can see Diane's hanging out in, in her comfy, comfy room. What room would you call that? It's kind Did of you like call it your mindfulness? Yeah, it's my mindfulness room. <laughs> So you guys are hearing birds in the background. It's it's because I'm in Bangkok, Thailand right now, and I, I'm in a part of this really large city where we're tucked away in this nice nature nook, and, and there's birds around. And the birds are, are saying hi to Diane and to everyone. Hi. I'm in Toronto, and it's freezing cold. What's the temperature? Well, last week... It was, you're not going to believe this, but minus 30 Celsius. It was, it's been really cold here. Today has been nice, but it's been really cold winter here. Negative yeah. 30? Oh my God. Celsius. Yeah. Can you imagine that? For like about no. two weeks or so, that was our temperature here. Oh my gosh, but it must be nice to just when you get to the, the practice space, studio space, that you can just unearth all the Eskimo layers and then... Well, the funny thing is, is I've been practicing in a greenhouse. So on sunny days, on, on like blue sky, sunny days, even if it's like minus 20 outside in the afternoon when the sun is shining, I can go into this plexiglass greenhouse at my parents' house and it's 20 degrees inside. And I'm, I'm in the sun, so it's been really actually kind of nice. But it hasn't been all bad. <laughs> wow, that sounds like an awesome space to practice in. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing there's room. There's It's not full of uh, rows of plants. There's no plants in there now, so it's all cleared out. And I just get up on the, on the table where my dad used to grow all his little plants. And I just have my Mexican blanket and my yoga mat out there. And that's where I've been practicing this winter on sunny days. Yeah. yeah. If you if you told that to me who I was a year ago, I would have gone Instagram crazy. I would have said, oh my gosh, can I take pictures of you practicing in there and share it on Instagram? <laughs> but now, I mean, I'll, I'll say the Instagram talk for another day, but. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, all right, well, we'll start now, but uh, you guys might see me swatting mosquitoes away, but we'll, we'll get started with our chat. And uh, again, I wanna thank you guys for joining in on this or watching the replay. This is a really special talk. Uh, the series is called Rogue Yogi Real Talk and it's a live version because we're having this heart to heart talk about yoga and movement and, and we're, essentially opening up our, our virtual living room to you guys so you have a chance to ask questions or you can listen to this like a podcast and the reason why this is a, a really special conversation is because i am sitting here from across the world with diane bruni who she she founded this Facebook group called Yoga and Movement Research Community, and there's over twenty three thousand members. And when I discovered the group, I I felt like a kid in a candy store, except it wasn't candy. It was all these golden nuggets of knowledge. And I was at a point in my practice and teaching where I. I started to ask questions of, you know, how come I'm getting injured all the time practicing certain things? And, you know, am I am I being safe with my students? And, you know, I was just at that, that fork in the road where I don't know if yoga, if I should keep teaching. And when I found Diane's group and met all these amazing advanced teachers who were also thinking the same thing, but had all this wide, vast knowledge in chiropractic and physiotherapy, all these other professions, I just thought, oh, I got to I gotta interview these folks and get to know them and be able to share their wisdom with everyone. And I just thought, oh, maybe one day Diane, <laughs> Diane would, would sit with me and, and let me interview her. And she said, yes, so, so we're here. <laughs> you guys get to see that. That's awesome. So... 
I'm going to go through a, a list of questions and we have uh, about an hour and we'll see how many questions we go through. But this is definitely the platform for Diane to, to, to share her heart out and uh, you guys get to get to enjoy. So as I swat the mosquitoes. Okay, Diane, I'm super excited to ask you these questions. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. So what was your first yoga class like? Like, how was that experience of taking that first class? Um, my first yoga class was with, have you ever heard of Yogi Bhajan? I did, actually. Yeah, he's the... Um, He's the Indian man who brought in who brought Kundalini yoga to the West. And um, my first yoga class ever was White Tantric Yoga Intensive Weekend with Yogi Bhajan. And I landed there by chance when I was 19 years old. A woman in a health food store handed me a flyer and looked at me in my eyes and said, you should come to this tonight. So I had planned to go out with my friends to party. And instead, I called them up and said I couldn't come because I had to go to this yoga thing. And I showed up at this old church downtown Toronto where the pe people were gathering. And there were hundreds of people. It was a huge deal. And they were all wearing white with turbans and their swords and their bracelets and white North American Sikhs who had taken on this, this religion as well as lifestyle and they were part of this community called 3HO. So um, I remember going in and this was before the day of yoga mats. So there were no yoga mats. These people were sitting on sheepskin rugs and um, in very, very straight, straight rows. And we all had to sit in perfectly straight lines. And then Yogi Bhajan came up and got up on the altar or stage or something and uh, the weekend began and basically the entire weekend was spent looking in so we sat across from a partner a stranger anybody a random person who we just happened to sit next to who became the partner for that session and we basically did our entire practice looking into each other's eyes doing like pranayam and chanting and like arm movements all sitting. We never stood up. We never laid down. So it was very weird. And I was 19 years old. But when I left that experience that night, I stood on the steps of the stairs looking out at the city lights. And I wondered to myself if I had done some hallucinogenic drugs, because I felt like I was in such an altered state. And then I reminded myself that I hadn't. And I realized at that moment that I had something to explore in this practice because I felt completely elated. I felt like I was really high and I was completely naturally drugged. So that was my introduction to yoga. And that's what kept me going back to Kundalini yoga for about seven or eight years with the community in Toronto. And, um, and then I got introduced to Iyengar yoga. And then I spent about another eight years with an Iyengar teacher. Her name was Lisa Schwartz, and she had just returned from Pune, India. She had just been there. Iyengar had just opened his institute in Pune, and she lived there with him for two years. She was a previous dancer from the United States, and uh, she ended up living in Toronto, and she started teaching out of her living room in this house in Toronto. I heard the yoga teachers talking about her at the Iyengar Institute where I was also taking classes. And I looked her up in the phone book and tracked her down and I was her first student in Toronto. And I started going to her living room and she agreed to teach me. And then eventually she said I could bring my friends. And then she started teaching other people and then her classes eventually grew and i was with her probably for seven or eight years the interesting thing about that experience was that she had learned from iyengar about 40 years ago when iyengar was still practicing vinyasa yoga because iyengar practiced ashtanga yoga so he was 
used to teaching vinyasa flow kind of classes back in the day before he got older before he started like breaking things down and getting really nitpicky and using all the props he, he didn't teach like that 40 years ago that was an evolution so she was his student when he was still teaching vinyasa classes so when she was teaching in in her living room in toronto she basically welcomed me to come and practice with her and she wouldn't talk to me while we were practicing she said you can come on sunday morning and practice with me for three hours she did her practice then her her big practice of the week and i was invited to come so i, was, I would just like practice beside her and try to keep up with her and watch her and then eventually i invited some friends and we started giving her some money so then she started to sort of teach us more but she was she was practicing vinyasa yoga even though she was an iyengar teacher that's kind of cool because <laughs> there weren't too many of them around at the time i actually i i saw a video recently well it's an old video but i saw this video of iyengar leading a group of students through a primary series and it was sped up really fast so yeah. it just looked really really wild to see that um especially she could, have, she could have been one of the people in the class of that video like that's you know she was with him for all the you know a long long time ago so really cool how things have evolved yeah and just knowing that that even Iyengar, he didn't stick with one style his whole life. And no. you know, there's a, there's a there's a group of people that regard the, his book Light on Yoga as, as the Bible right. of yoga and how a pose should look, how an asana should look. And you know, even hearing from some of his colleagues that he wasn't trying to tell people that your pose is supposed to look like that. <laughs> so right, right. And Trina says hi. Trina Altman says hi. She says, I'm so happy that you're interviewing Diane. Oh, that's nice. Hey, Trina. So I'll move on to the next question for you, okay. Diane. What was it like going into yoga as a student versus as a teacher? Ah. I guess going in as a student was just, I was in complete awe. It was like just the most incredible experience. And I just, I guess I can say I kind of surrendered to the experience of the Kundalini classes for years and then being led by Lisa, just sort of like following along with her. Um, going in as a teacher, I was a lot, I was nervous. <laughs> I was really nervous going in as a teacher because when I started to teach, I had really no idea what I was doing. And I was teaching from, I was teaching from my own practice. So I started teaching like 22 years ago. By then I had already been practicing about 15 years on a pretty consistent basis. So I went in to teach my first classes with no teaching experience at all, no teacher training program, that's for sure. And, uh, but just really teaching from my own experience practicing. So I was nervous is what I want to say. I wasn't, uh, Going in as a student was a lot different than going in as a teacher. But I got to say, my first few classes only had two or three people in them, and they were my friends. So I was nervous for a little while, but it, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> I wasn't going into a studio that was expecting me to be something at that point. Yeah, I feel like uh, the first couple of classes are our friends and community and doing some community classes. And, right. you know, we, at least in, in my experience, it was like reciting a script over and over and over until the personality started to show. Right, right. What's well, interesting, the first classes I taught were Ashtanga Yoga Primary Series. And I had never taken an Ashtanga Yoga Primary Series class when I taught it. So I was, I was, I was teaching from my experience of practicing it from a video, from Richard Freeman's video. And this was before the days of the internet. So the very, one of the very first yoga videos that came out was Richard Freeman's VHS video on the primary series. I saw an ad for it and I ordered it and it came in the mail. 
and I put it in the machine and watched it on my TV and practiced with it every day for months. And then a friend of mine was opening a studio and she knew she, I was, you know, there, there were people into yoga, but I had been doing it longer in, in my little circle of people than anyone, you know, than a lot of people. So she kind of talked me into going in to teach. And uh, she said I could teach whatever I wanted. So I said, okay, great, cool. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to teach this like Ashtanga yoga thing that I've been doing with the video. And she said, sure, Diane, you can do whatever you want. So it, it was really kind of funny because nobody had heard of it and there were no Ashtanga teachers in Canada. And um, there, were, there were teachers in New York and there were teachers in LA and there were teachers in Maui, which I learned about all of them shortly after that. But there were no teachers in Canada. So that was kind of funny when I think back. It's like, I can't believe I was doing that. I guess I was the first person in Canada teaching Ashtanga yoga based on what I learned from watching this video, which is really crazy, but true. <laughs> well, I guess in today's day, modern age, it's, it's people learning from YouTube. <laughs> That's right. So I was on the cutting edge of that. I ordered that video and, um, and then after that, as, you know, as soon as I really, I got into teaching at this studio, and the classes went from like two or three people to 20 people to 30 people to packed classes to eventually opening a studio like two years later. And I, you know, I went out of my way to learn from all the teachers who were a lot more experienced than me. So all the teachers in New York and L.A. and Hawaii, I brought them all up. I went down to visit with them and I really immerse myself in the culture as much as I could without going to Mysore, India. I'm, I'm, I'm giggling to myself because right now to try to go to Mysore and do a month with the Sharath or uh, his mother, Saraswati, it's like 500 something US, which is about the same in Canadian, right? Yeah, it's expensive for sure. And, uh, yeah, I was never never really something I ever really was that interested in doing for a number of different reasons. So have you, did you ever go to India at all? No, I never went to India. You know, I, I'd heard some crazy stories about what was going on in Mysore and um, uh, some bad stuff that was going on as far as I was concerned. I didn't want to go and study with Patabi Joyce because I heard what kind of adjustments he was doing on women. So I just stayed clear of that whole scene, but I love the practice, but would not subject myself to that kind of environment. So that's why I never went there. So I'll move on to the next question. Okay. So this is a two part question. The first one is what shifted for you uh, to start thinking outside of the box, the wow. yoga box? Yeah. Wow. So what happened was I uh, I opened a studio with a, a business partner and um, it was the first Ashtanga based studio in, in Toronto and uh, we got really busy really fast because the Ashtanga thing, basically the yoga explosion kind of happened like the year after we opened our studio. Um, things all of a sudden, it went from being like, you know, a few studios in Toronto that not really anybody ever went to. It was like really small to all of a sudden, it was hugely popular um, thanks to Sting and Madonna. And I really think that it was because these two major rock stars got into Ashtanga yoga, um, that the thing, it just took off, it just like, who exploded. And so I was the owner of the studio and um, teaching Ashtanga and kind of. And then after the first couple of years of teaching, I realized that the traditional Ashtanga practice, just doing primary series um, and teaching people who had never done yoga before, that wasn't working. So that wasn't working. We realized that really early on, actually and realized that we were not going to teach in our lead classes strict Ashtanga. 
So we started modifying it right away, like leaving out the intense lotus postures and the legs behind the head. We were just leaving out that stuff, of course, because nobody could do it. And then the people who sort of could do it were getting hurt really quick doing it, like after a few months or a year or so. We started modifying things. I continued to practice it. We had Mysore classes at our studio and I continued to practice the traditional primary series. Um, and for many years, it worked great. The first five years, I'd say I was like in bliss. I was in heaven. And then I got knee injuries. Um, and then I had to leave out half lotus and the lotus postures. And then I realized that I needed to, well, everybody in the yoga world told me that the reason I hurt my knees was because my hips weren't open enough. So I started doing hip openers, a lot of hip openers for many years. And um, my hips opened a lot. They were really open. I was like able to do poses I wasn't able to do, you know, five years previous or two years previous even. And things were changing very, very quickly in my body. My practice was advancing and um, I liked it. I liked it. I was finally able to do some of the postures that I had been striving to do and it felt great. Um, and my knee pain had gone away because I'd stopped doing a lot of the lotus postures and I moved on to a lot of like really deep, like working on hip openers. Um, and then what happened was about eight or nine years ago, I can't remember exactly if it was eight or nine years ago, but I um, was bending over and Parsarita Padottanasana, you know, wide legs, standing wide legs, hinging forward. And I hinged forward and heard four loud pops. Pop, 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 pop. And my hip basically dislocated. And I was in the middle of teaching a class. This is a crazy story. There were probably 50 people in my class. It was Sunday morning at the studio, the, you know, popular class. And I, so these pops happened. I sat down at the, you know, I used to teach with the, the students looking in. So I was like in the middle of the room, but that was my spot as the teacher. So I sat down and like I was in Dandasana for the rest of the class and I continued, I taught the entire class, I verbalized the entire class and no one knew what had happened to me. I went into kind of like this trance shock state where I continued to teach the class. I was not gonna let on that I was injured. And when I tried to move, the pain was so intense, I just like froze and I never moved again and no one noticed. So at the end of the class, everybody left and the room was empty and I went to get up and I was like, like this, like dying. To, like it was, I couldn't even get up. Someone looked in the room and saw me struggling and said, Diane, do you need help? And I said, yeah, I need help. So, so whoever that person was came in and I kind of like hold, held on to them and pulled myself up and they kind of, I leaned on them. I limped out the door. I got in a taxi and I went home. And um, that was the turning point because what I learned after that, what I had done was I had torn the deep rotators off the bone. Before that injury had happened, just before that injury had happened, before the class, as the class was coming in, I was sitting and meditating. And I was sitting in Padmasana and Baddha Konasana. And I had been sitting for about an hour. I like to sit and meditate before I taught. So that's what I was doing that morning. And, and I was kind of praising myself for like, my knees are down on the ground and I feel so open. I don't have any pain. And I gave myself a little pat on the back. Like, isn't this great? Yoga is working for me. I actually said those things to myself. And then the people came in, they've packed in. I started the class. I wasn't 
in that particular pose, I wasn't even all the way in, right? You got to remember, I was just standing there and I went to hinge. I was at about 90 degrees when the pops happened. So I wasn't doing anything extreme when it happened. But what I was doing before it happened was I was sitting. And everything was, it was a hot summer day. Everything was very open and very relaxed. And that last little pull in that pose and my, literally my muscles came off my bone. That's literally what happened. It was crazy. I consulted with sports medicine doctor, the head of sports medicine at the University of Toronto is a really good friend of my brother. And he examined me. He told me what he thought had happened. He kept asking me what I was doing when it happened. And I said, I was doing it really simple. I wasn't even in the whole pose and it wasn't even a deep pose and no, nobody touched me and it wasn't an assist. And he said, but what were you doing before that happened? So I told him I had been sitting, meditating. He said, for how long? He asked me what posture. And then he went on to explain to me what he thought had happened. And he said to me, this is an amazing analogy I'll never forget. He said, imagine, Diane, you take a piece of meat and you hang it from a hook. After 20 minutes, and I'll, I'll get these numbers wrong because I don't remember the numbers, but you'll get the point. After 20 minutes, the meat is going to hang down a little bit lower. And after another 20 minutes, the meat is going to hang down a little bit lower. And then after an hour, the meat's hanging down a little lower, and all you have to do is tap it or blow on it, and it's going to fall off the hook. And that's what happened to you today. That's really messed up. That's what happened to me. I had gotten to the point in my practice where everything was so open and was hanging on by a bare fibers, like and then one last little thing, and it just went, boom, it just popped, it broke. So what happened was, this is really fucked up. What happened was, someone told me to watch that, watch the F word when you're doing this talk. Um, Why? Well, what <laughs> this, this is Rogue Yogi real talk. It's okay, you can, <laughs> you can say whatever F Thank word you, you like. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, what happened was um, it, I had to stop. Well, I couldn't walk for a while. Couldn't walk for about a week without extreme pain. And then um, I started doing rehab and, and getting a lot of information and, and feedback. And what I realized in my rehab was that I had completely dysfunctional glutes. So my glutes and my hips were not working. Not only the injured side, of course, but the uninjured side, I was not able to recruit or fire those muscles. They were just not working. They were just like they'd gone to sleep because I had been doing so much hip opening and so much stretching and so much releasing so that I could get into those postures that... Um, and relaxing of the glutes, right? So, you know, I used to teach everybody to relax their glutes in every pose, basically, especially back bends, the one time you're actually supposed to use your glutes. But we were ill-informed ill and um, we just didn't, I didn't know any better. I was doing what I had been taught. And what I learned in my rehab was that I had major dysfunction in my body because of my yoga practice. And I was injured because I had overstretched and overopened and I had, I was completely unstable. So when I began to stabilize and figure out how to stabilize and how to get strong, um, I realized that I had been just living in this kind of, I was missing a big piece of the puzzle because um, in the yoga practice, we were just not really well informed about simple and basic biomechanics. The goal was to do the sequence and to do the postures. And it wasn't really based on functional movement. 
So I learned my lesson the hard way, unfortunately. It was a really, really hard period. And then when I learned about how to stabilize and how to strengthen glutes and how important that was, I started integrating that, of course, into my classes, into my teaching. And that caused a lot of friction because there were a lot of yoga teachers, especially my community at the studio. Now I was saying something that was very different from what they were saying and what they were teaching. So we were in conflict with one another. And this was creating an incredible amount of stress in my life because I was trying to teach from a place of honesty and authenticity about this is what I went through in my body. I'm trying to get my own body strong now. So I'm going to teach you the exercises I'm learning that are working for me. And I'm not going to teach you those extreme poses anymore because I'm not doing them anymore. And I'm trying, just trying to figure out how to get healthy here and get balanced and get strong again and not be in pain. So that caused a lot of friction because the community, my business partner, the other teachers at the studio, they were on the same path that I was on before my injury. So I had the injury. It was a life-changing event for me, but for everybody else, life went on and they didn't really want anything to change. So it's pretty hard, but I would so, say that was the turning point. Yeah, I was going to ask you, that, that was the second half of the question when you realized there's a problem. I mean, the first obviously was when you got so injured, but the major problem is that you have this revelation, you have this epiphany and no one is, no one is seeing it or hearing you. No, it was, um, it was really difficult. You know, the people who didn't know anything else, like for instance, students coming in who are just starting yoga, they thought it was just, they didn't care what I was teaching in classes. Like they didn't care if I was doing glute strengthening or whatever, or pinch or myurasana. They just came to be in their bodies, have a challenging experience, get a bit of a workout. But I found ways to like make it all work. So no, the, the stress was with my, my, uh, my teaching um, community, the, the other teachers at the studio, my business partner. We were now on two very different pages and it was really challenging, super stressful. We have someone in the chat room saying, saying that gives me validation to keep up with teaching strengthening moves in my classes. Absolutely, absolutely. That's for sure. That's for sure. That's what people need. They need everything, but we all need to do the strengthening movements. And if the strengthening movements are done in full range, then you're getting enough mobility. You're getting enough mobility into your body and in, into your joints that you'll ever need in your life. So that's what, you know, we're, we're starting to realize is functional mobility. Like how much flexibility does anybody need to be healthy? Those are big, big questions. Yeah. Even to this day, I'll have some friends and, and some students that will ask me, Hey, my heels can't touch the ground when I'm in down, down dog. What's right. wrong with me? What am I doing wrong? And when I even start, to, when I even try to explain and say, hey, you know, that's that's not a problem, actually, because my heels can touch the ground, but I feel like I'm a little too flexible right now. I have to do strength, strengthening. And that that doesn't, that kind of goes over their heads. And, and then I have to stop myself and, and, and I don't know how to approach the, the topic because it's, it's so ingrained, especially with the whole social media and the Instagram with the hyperflexibility. They see that this superstar has their heels touching the ground, so they should have their bodies looking like that. It's 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 kind of a fighting an uphill battle, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 challenging right now, but things are changing, so that's that's really good news. Yeah. There's the beginning of the next wave is happening. Well, that, that's a good segue into one of these <laughs> questions. Where do you see the trend of yoga going? Ah, 
Well, I, uh, I just spent the weekend with my daughter, Catherine Bruni Young, who's 28 years old, who started doing yoga with me when she was, well, she's been coming to my classes since she was a baby, basically, since she was a toddler. And then I got her into gymnastics and dance, et cetera. By the time she was a young teen, she was coming to my classes to do the classes with the adults. And she went on to do her teacher training when she was 16. And she was teaching classes when she was 16, as soon as she did her training with us. And by the time she was 22, she was in chronic pain. It coincided with the time of my injuries as well. So it was very interesting timing. I was like 52, she was 22, and we were both injured and we were both in pain from yoga. So we both went in our own directions. I, I became very interested in this movement practice, movement community called the Axis Syllabus. And I met these people who introduced me to it and I really got into that. And it's all nonlinear, fluid, undulating, beautiful movement. Just feels so wonderful. She got into strength training and started studying with Ido Portel and um, uh, personal trainers. And she went down that, that route, that road. And she runs programs now. So this weekend she was in Toronto teaching a weekend workshop. And uh, the people who are going to her workshops, and she teaches all over the country now. Next year, she's traveling in Europe, or this year, I guess. She's traveling in Europe for a month. And um, her workshops are all selling out. They're all full of primarily yoga teachers who are injured. And they're coming to her because she's teaching something called mindful strength. And her her classes and her workshops are kind of yoga-like. Like, you know, on a mat, in an empty room, pretty much minimal props, you know, the regular things, really, blocks and balls and things like that. But she teaches a class that kind of resembles yoga. The vibe, the energy, the environment, the pace, but it's all strength-based exercise. And that's where I think it's going. And I think it's really awesome that my daughter is actually doing where, doing what I think needs to be done exactly <laughs> to turn this around so that we don't have to, um, we don't have to leave our communities and our studios to that we love, that are already established, that are already built, that are already you know, full of people who really want to feel better in their bodies and get healthy and be happier in their bodies. Um, I don't think these people actually really care what they're doing in their classes as long as it's working for them. So um, I think that the trend is moving towards away from extreme yoga towards more strength-based functionally sound, healthy, functional movement practices, um, either on the mat or off the mat, off the mat movement. So more of these um, natural movement, primal movement, animal movement, animal flow, like there's so many different types of movement practices now that are becoming more well known move nat like i can't think of them all and the axis syllabus of course is in that vein as well somatic practices i think are going to become like we were talking about feldenkrais things like feldenkrais and alexander technique and hannah somatics and then of course there's like the practices that have been around for thousands of years like qigong and, and tai chi like i think those practices are going to begin to find their way into people's movement practices because they're brilliant and they've actually been tested and been around for thousands of years, not like vinyasa yoga, which has only been around for about 120 or 130 years and has never really been tested on the bodies of middle-aged women. The majority of the people who are doing yoga right now on planet Earth 
are women, mostly women, mostly in their 30s, 40s. And those of us that have been doing it a long time, now we're in our 50s and 60s. And it's our generation, unfortunate, but not really. Like my daughter, she's 28. She was injured. Um, so I think the trend is moving away from being so dogmatic and so neurotic and so fundamentalist in our attitudes about yoga. Like what I, I always told my students, never go to the gym, because if you went to the gym, you would get strong and then you would get tight and that would take away from your yoga practice. I probably told hundreds of people that which was unfortunately the wrong advice. Now, what I say, what my daughter says is like, yeah, sure, do your vinyasa flow class once or twice a week. Go to the gym, like do some loading, like lift some weights, use, you know, lift some weights, do some like actual resistance exercise once or twice a week. And then go do something else that is just fun, like go dance or go swim or go ride a horse or go do something else that's just like you love to do and it's fun and just like keep mixing it up. And as soon as you get good at one thing, like do something else and learn a new skill and keep adding more diversity to your movement practice so that you lessen the chances of repetitive strain injury. So we don't actually think that yoga is actually all that bad. The extreme stuff I think is, is particularly risky, but the regular kind of like basic yoga postures, like standing poses, sun series, basic back bends, I don't think those are the problem. I think the problem is well, I, for me, for sure, and my daughter, for sure, and what I'm seeing in my community is we did too much of it. We did too much of it. And we didn't do other things. We didn't go to the gym. We didn't lift weights. We didn't do other activities because we were so focused on yoga. And we were told, like I was, you know, I entered the Ashtanga world six days a week. And if I practiced five days a week, I felt guilty because I wasn't doing six days a week. So that was my culture, right? That was my community. I bought in. And now I see it as like, it's weird. Now I see it as, it's, that's a cult. Don't tell me what to do six days a week and make me feel guilty for not doing it. Now I see it completely differently. But at the time, I really believed it. And it was that believing in this system that caused the problems, caused me the injuries, because I just believed it. And I did it every day, um, five or six days a week for about 10 years until I got the first, you know, the bad, in, and then, you know, the knee injury led to the hip injury. But if I had been going to the gym, and if I had maintained my strength and stability, I don't think the yoga would have injured me. So I think I just like, I, I it wasn't a balanced approach in my life, because I actually loved, you know, my, I loved my practice. And I, I loved everything about it until I got injured. I just thought it was the greatest thing in the world. So, um, yeah, I think we just kind of like messed up the proportions a little bit. So I think that's what's going to change. I think we were talking about this before. Studios that are going to offer more diverse classes and practices. So instead of like the Feldenkrais studio being over there and the Alexander Technique people being there and the Hannah Somatic lady coming out of her house and the ecstatic dance is only happening like at certain locations, it's like, like you know, together. Like so that studios, instead of just offering vinyasa flow classes like four or five times a day, if they offered all these different classes so their, their community would do different classes every day. I, I think it's actually a really simple solution to just deal with, with, with the lack of diversity is just add diversity. And then, you know, everybody, everybody prospers from that. The people who are part of yoga communities, I don't know what your experience has been, to get really attached to the people and going to the same place and the routine of that and feeling at home there that it's really hard to like go somewhere else. Like people get kind of like 
a lot of people like that routine. So if the studio owners and studio and yoga teachers were more well-rounded in their approach so that they could offer different types of classes so that like a functional strength class but still have the energy of a yoga class you don't have to do trikonasana you can do like hamstring strengthening instead of hamstring over stretching and have the same kind of experience of mindfulness and um so that's how I think it's all going to change. It's just like if yoga teachers are just going to keep expanding their their repertoire so that they won't be limited to like these poses and this box and like always the same way every day. Yeah, and I, was, I was sharing with Diane earlier before we began our broadcast that I, I spent some time in Chiang Mai, Thailand and there is a yoga studio there called the Yoga Tree. And that was the first time I saw a Feldenkrais class being offered in my travels. And as soon as I saw that, jumped on it. And within one hour of a session of Feldenkrais, and for those of you that have never tried Feldenkrais before, I can tell you as a newbie, as a complete beginner, that I learned things about how my body was operating. I learned so many things. I learned more in that hour than I did in my 15 years of practice. Mm -hmm. And in my five, six years of teaching yoga, you know, taking that Feldenkrais class, and I think back to all the times I try to teach and try to give the cues to my students and seeing just how none of my cues were helping with a student getting connected to their body. And I'm thinking, well, if, if people learn some Feldenkrais first, they could apply it to, to their yoga, to their martial arts, to their functional movement, day-to-day -day living. And anyway, I'm getting super excited about Feldenkrais right now, obviously. Yes, <laughs> and, well um, and I'll, and I'll be interviewing the teacher, Tara Eden, in a, a future Rogue Yogi Real Talk. So anyway, that, that studio has Qigong, Feldenkrais, ecstatic dance, uh, variation of that. And, it, you know, that'd be awesome to see that kind of model happening in other parts around the world. Yeah, I think it's already happening, you know. So I have friends in Toronto who have studios and um, they're doing this, they're doing this exact same thing. Like they're already integrating functional movement classes. Um, I'm gonna be teaching in the, in the spring for a couple of studios. They're bringing in functional movement classes and they need, you know, some basic information to sort of get started. And uh, it's starting, it's starting to happen. They're not taking up a big percentage of the schedule but they're starting and why because the owners of the studios who are practitioners of yoga have all been injured so they've all had to leave the yoga world to rehab to figure out what went wrong they got interested in these other practices and now they want to bring these practices into their studios because being a yoga practitioner and a studio owner i always wanted in my studio what i wanted for myself so when these yoga teachers who are studio owners get injured, go out, learn about Qigong or Feldenkrais or Axis Syllabus or MoveNat or whatever it is, they end up finding the teachers and bringing them in. So that's how it's kind of all happening now. It's all like older injured yoga studio owners who are beginning to <laughs> create the changes so that people coming in, like in the next, in five years from now, when this is more natural, more normal, they won't even be so sure what a traditional yoga class looks like anymore because they'll be exposed to so much different types of movement and intelligent movement and really healthy and fun and functional movement along with more, you know, traditional Ashtanga or Iyengar, which I think those things are really going to simmer down a little bit. Like, I don't think they're going to become the most popular things in the future. I think we're definitely shifting to more towards a more uh, 
I'm going to say not necessarily functional, but yeah, functional, functional movement intelligence, you know, because we just really want to just keep moving well and be really, you know, healthy in our bodies as we age. So whether or not doing those poses is necessary for that, probably not. We'll probably benefit more from doing some squats and some deadlifts and some other movements and crawling, maybe some rolling around on the floor. I can't believe I used to make fun of people doing Tai Chi and Qigong. I, I, when I was younger, I just saw that and thought it was so ridiculous. But then when I actually took a Qigong class the other week, it was kicking my ass. Yeah. You know, there, there's just so many, there's all these nuances. And, you know, it just makes me appreciate that, you know, there, there's a reason why I would call that technology. Technology like that has been around for so long. Um, exactly, and 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 qigong and tai chi are kind of like the softer versions of these more dynamic martial arts like kung fu. And um, so the movements that they're that they're teaching, even at the lowest level, qigong and tai chi are for like everybody, old people, everybody. Um, they're very complex movement patterns. They move in three-dimensional spheres as opposed to linear spheres, always in the, these flat, square fl planes. Qigong is like these linear, three-dimensional movement patterns that are um, really hard to actually do well and understand. So it's a different kind of discipline because it's, yeah, it's not like something you can just like do over and over again, right? And like, yes, I can do this, I can do this. It's like, what the heck is going on? It's like, it takes years really to understand what's really going on. So it's kind of cool, right? But it's harder to grasp. Let's see, we have some people in the chat room. Okay. Is hey, Liz from Charlottesville, and I'm totally on board with this. Very cool stuff. My teaching is totally heading this direction. Nice. Another, another guest that said, this is great stuff. I have many teacher friends I would love to share this video with. Will it be accessible after the live chat? Yes. So I'll be sending the replay of this video later in the week. So if you had registered for, well, yeah, <laughs> that's how you're in the chat room. If you registered, you're getting a replay. And then I'll share it with Diane and we can, we can share it everywhere because this is a really, really important talk. This is a really, this is, this is a really intimate talk. And I'm, I'm really happy that we get to sit here and, and be frank about this because there's still a whole world of teachers that may, yoga teachers that may not know about this yet. Maybe they're really new, maybe they just got certified and they'll go through their journey. That's Some right. of them might make the decision early on that they wanna balance it out with weight training and resistance and, and, and fluid movement. Or maybe some of them will be like me and you, Diane, where we took a decade at least and you know got through some injuries and started asking questions and regardless of where the teacher is at this is this is something that anyone can revisit and and listen to and think about and start making shifts in their own practice and their own teaching it's so true you know and i think that's a really important aspect to consider about this conversation is that everybody will you know come to their own conclusions about timing and about you know decisions and choices that they make um and yeah like you said like if if i hadn't been injured i'd still be doing yoga because it was my everything it was my life i, I everything about it i just loved so i would have definitely kept doing it so it took a major, severe, traumatic experience for me to stop and start asking questions. And uh, I wouldn't. I, I think a lot of people are going to come to that conclusion on their own time. 
But I, my hope is that yoga teachers will get smarter so that less people will be injured and will still be able to continue to their, enjoy their yoga, that they don't have to go through what I went through or what you went through or what so many of my friends have gone through who are now like figuring out what the heck we're supposed to do. So if we had had a more balanced approach to it early on as we were introduced to it, if our teachers had encouraged us to go to the gym and add a lot of diversity to our movement practices, a lot less people will get injured. So I, I'm kind of like hoping that we can sort of change the mentality of yoga teachers so that yoga teachers are not so limited in their thinking that yoga has to look a certain way and that we can change what we're doing in the class and still make it a mindful class, whether we call it yoga or something else, mindful movement or mindful st mindful strength or any functional something, you know, no one's sure what to call it anymore. Um, but I'm hoping that we can turn it around so that people don't have to get so injured to change and then have to leave like so leave the studio right and have to go to the gym like can we just like bring some of the gym into the studio like just having like a wall of kettlebells and a wall of resistance bands and you know like just a few props can make a huge difference in someone's practice it just takes a little re-educating, a little thinking outside the box and a little bit of um, just being open-minded that we don't have to like limit ourselves and what we call yoga and what we consider yoga to be, what it means for us. Yeah. And I think there's a, a sense of empowerment to instill in each and every one that watches this video or even in, especially in your Facebook group, right. that we can we can begin to trust ourselves and explore our bodies and give ourselves permission to try something and assess: Does this work? Does this not work? Can I go this direction or that direction? And not put all of that power into a teacher who could be like you and me or our viewers that we're, we're still figuring shit out. So if we're still figuring shit out and we're still evolving and we're still learning, then I think that makes sense that as a student, you can, fig you can you know, trust yourself and figure it out within yourself as we learn together. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we talked a little bit before about trends in the future and I think that one of the biggest things that I, I, I see happening and changing is how we're understanding the effects of trauma and how we as yoga teachers and movement educators, how we communicate and how we connect with people in the classroom, that's also changing. So instead of being coming from a very authoritarian place, where the teacher is telling the student what to do and exactly what to do and how to do it and what they sh what they should be feeling, that's all changing to well encouraging our students to actually feel for themselves what they're actually feeling and not to superimpose those feelings for them and tell them what they should be feeling. So the whole um, mindset of how we're communicating. And, and, and sharing with our, 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 our little community is changing, right? So from a less authoritarian standpoint to a more um, uh, open and sensitive and uh, more uh, helping people to really feel for themselves instead of being told what to do and being so dogmatic and precise in alignment principles that we've now learned are not that beneficial necessarily and are certainly no indicator that we will be in less risk by doing things in perfect alignment. We're actually realizing now that this obsession with perfection in alignment has actually been shown to be more problematic than helpful. That it's actually better for people to just 
move well and understand how their own bodies move and to not be preoccupied with how something is supposed to look from the outside and there and to allow for a lot of variability in alignment and actually do things sometimes out of alignment because it's actually good for the body to move in so many different ways that might even look a little bit wrong like knee in a certain way that you know in yoga it's like things had to be like this you know like these right angles everything like perfectly lined well actually the body's not shaped that way things aren't actually supposed to always be lined up that way like always in flux and moving so encouraging students to explore those fluid states as opposed to these precise and static places i think that's you know also another way that we can help people break free of these mind constraints that we have about right and wrong yeah and as you did that i started voguing so yeah you know we don't <laughs> And we don't really vlog in real life and we don't ever find ourselves in warrior one in real life. You know, it, <laughs> yeah. I try to think in my mind through the whole history of my life, when did I need to suddenly bust into warrior one? But I, I still love the pose. <laughs> oh, yeah. so we, we have some more uh, guests chatting and, and then we'll wrap up our, our conversation. Okay. So one guest said, thank you for this. I have been practicing physiotherapy for 30 years and also yoga. I took a yoga teacher training course in 2015 to try to find out where the teachers were coming from and why so many of my clients who practiced yoga were injuring themselves. Wow. I have also many other backgrounds in movement genres. I bring all to my physiotherapy practice as well as my self yoga and movement practice. Thank you for what you are doing. I've been trying to help my clients help themselves in recovery and in injury prevention. And your leadership in the movement community is making a big difference. Always open-minded and open to change, helping others to help themselves. Wow. Wow. And then, and then our last guest said, I'm very grateful that my teachers, Scaravelli inspired, incorporated Feldenkrais, lots of rolling around and playing in our teacher training also encouraging us to try different things and find what works best in our bodies. Nice. Wow. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. So you're getting a lot of love, Diane, a lot of uh, gratitude and appreciation. And, and uh, I can speak for myself and all our viewers. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to to share with us about your history with yoga and, and the future of it and your commitment to helping as many people as possible learn to discover themselves and, and to develop their mindfulness in healthy ways. Thank you so much for doing the work that you do and um, inviting me to join you on uh, a part of the journey we share and, and, and you know, our individual journeys and how we we intermingle and 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 meet one another and um yeah it's it's been it's been really wonderful to be um a part of your your thing here tonight so thank you so much thank you diane and, and for everyone else if you're not already in diane's facebook group please share this video please share her group with your friends and other fellow practitioners in movement and wellness. It's called Yoga and Movement Research Community. There's over 23,000 members and growing. And every day throughout the day, there are people sharing some amazing bits on research, exploration, and it's, it's just so helpful. It's been so valuable. And I, I'm a fan. Yay. Like Thank you so much for that. Yay. I'm so glad. I'll see you all there. Yeah, see you guys all there. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>